Nehemiah 6, verses 2 through 7, says this. Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message, talking to Nehemiah. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messenger, messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down from the wall he was building. Why should the work cease while I leave to go, to leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me the same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king, and they've even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf there is a king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king. So come, let's confer together. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we approach your word this morning knowing that it was inspired by you. It comes to us as a revelation of you, a revelation of your son Jesus, as a revelation of ourselves, of how we're to live, of how we're to have a relationship with you. And as we're thinking about this morning, how we're to be available to you. So Father, we just say individually, collectively right now, here's our hearts. They're uh, available to you this morning. So speak to us, we pray, by your spirit, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, so we're, as Brent mentioned, in the middle of our Fat Church series, um, which I have been looking at for months now, and still it makes me laugh, so I hope it makes you chuckle as well. But really, what we're doing in over the course of this short series is studying and learning how to be um, faithful and how to be available, and how to be teachable, and how those, those three kind of categories of behavior, or those patterns of behavior, set us up to be better followers of Jesus. So if we consider our lives and kind of cast them against these categories, it's kind of a good rubric. How, how, how faithful am I? How available? How, how teachable am I? It's a, good, it's a good way of measuring, okay, these are good ways of following Jesus as a church, helps us frame a discussion of what our life as a church trying to be like Jesus looks like. And this week, we're focusing in on being available. And, you know, for me, and prob- probably for you, for me, this, this category sounds like uh, it's going to be more things to add to the calendar. Like, this is how you be available. Like, I need you to carve out some time so that you're, you know, free. <laughs> It's another, another, what did um, Hunter said? It's like another call you have to be ready to answer. And as I was thinking about this, like how can I possibly be available for another thing? Most of us have already filled our lives or how our lives, have our lives filled for us by other things. So this notion, I think even more than faithfulness, this notion of availability is kind of confrontational right out of the gate. It kind of feels like, oh, you're, you're asking me to really rearrange my life in order to become available. It just kind of feels like that for me. It feels like it's going to be an instruction that adds things to your life. You have to be ready to do more in order to be a follower of Jesus. But hear this, and I think this is really important, just kind of get this as our um, foundation for this discussion. To be available as a follower of Jesus, you don't need to be busier. You need to be braver. To be available, you don't really have to become less, you don't really have to become less busy You have to become more brave (laughs) because it's courage, actually. It's trust to say, I'm going to leave some things out of my life in order to include others. It's bravery to look at some of the the things in this world and make the decision that those things just don't need to take up my time. Those things just don't need to occupy my bandwidth. I think being an available community that follows Jesus is about understanding, like, life might be calling you, like, 
drawing you in 20 different directions. You and I need to be brave enough, brave about what calls you to leave it to the Lord. You know, what, what you need to be leaving to God and what calls you need to answer yourself. Nehemiah, to me, is maybe one of the quintessential examples of this. In chapter 6, as Brent read, and if you don't know kind of the flow of the story of Nehemiah, it might be a little bit hard to kind of uh, jump on the treadmill here while it's already spinning, um, but just as kind of an under, to help us all understand, Nehemiah has traveled, this guy Nehemiah, he's traveled to Jerusalem, he's overseeing the work of rebuilding the city, rebuilding the walls around the city. It's a big project, as you could imagine. Jerusalem had been seriously damaged over time by wars and battles and stuff like that. And Nehemiah has come to sort of manage the reconstruction of this whole city. So he comes in with some people and they're managing this massive construction project. And he's, he's been given this task. You know, the reason he's doing it is because the Lord has given it to him to do. He's gathered, Nehemiah's gathered the support. He's assembled a group of people together who are all this together. They're living in community together. They're working together. They're serving the Lord together. And, and while they're doing this together, while they're accomplishing this thing, kind of living in obedience, building up this city in accordance with what God has had them to do, while they're in the middle of this, something happens while they're doing this work. He's living in this place of obedience to God, of kind of orienting his life around serving the Lord, doing what God had called him to do. And suddenly, these other calls start coming in. And it's, this, happen, this happens, actually. is when you're chasing after the Lord, that's when distractions start to come, right? Do you really need to commit that time to studying God's word? Wouldn't you rather watch TV? Yes, I would rather watch TV. Do you really need to spend time in prayer? You've been praying a lot. Do you really need to spend more time in prayer? Wouldn't you rather check your phone? Yes, I'd rather check my phone. Do you really need to get to church? Wouldn't you rather stay home in your pajamas? You don't have to talk to anyone? Yes. This is what happens for, okay, this is what happens for Nehemiah because he's in this place of service. He's in this place of obedience. He's uh, doing what the Lord has, has called him to do, working on this project. And then these other calls start coming in saying, don't you think you should be looking over here? Take a break from your work. Come meet with us. I want to be very clear about this because God has him doing this thing. He's living in obedience to God. And while he's in that pattern, this, these other voices by, by way of messengers come in and say, enough of that. <laughs> You've been doing that for a while. Isn't it more important that you come spend some time doing this thing over here? Let's not pretend like this is an easy decision to make either because you and I know that living in obedience to God is not always easy Certainly not as easy as we'd like to think it should be. Living in obedience to God means I'm surrendering obedience to myself, right? It means I'm giving up control of what, kind of the way I want things to go, and I'm saying, okay, Lord, but your will be done. It means I'm, I'm laying aside my things instead, picking up the things of God. And Nehemiah is living for the Lord here, which is sometimes costly. It's sometimes not easy. It's sometimes difficult. So don't pretend like it's an easy decision when somebody says, you know, you've been doing that for a while, Nehemiah. You've been working hard for a while. Why don't you come away and come talk to us instead? They're offering Nehemiah a break from this labor. And then they make it even harder when he says, no, I'm not going to come down there. Why should I stop doing what I'm doing uh, to come talk to you? They make it even harder. They start to tempt him by insulting him. They start to tell these lies about him, these rumors that he's leading a revolution in Jerusalem. People are saying these things about you, Nehemiah. You better come meet with us in order to clear it up, right? They're, sp they're spreading some lies about him. And don't you think you should come clear this up? Don't you think you should come clear your name? They're trying different tactics. Okay, you can't be distracted by this. How about you be distracted by something else? So why don't you come clear your name, you know? You're needed. We need you to clear this up. They're dragging his name through the mud. They invite him to the valley. Do you see what the valley is named? This is my, one of my favorite parts of scripture. Oh, no. <laughs> come to the valley of Odo. Oh, no. <laughs> they should have picked a better place. 
He was able to make this decision. He told these people, I'm busy doing what the Lord has for me to do. I'm not about to stop, right? Being available is a question of scheduling. Being available only for the right things, that's a question of bravery. Listen here, any of us can change our schedules, but being available only for the right things, that's a question of bravery. It's a question of faith. The first thing a community that seeks to be available needs to understand, we live in a culture where calendars are full, and I know yours are, where your mind will be filled with any number of ideas, thoughts, plans, and and we can only do some things at the expense of ignoring others, right? So we need to be brave enough and look at some of these things and remember uh, that valley and say, oh, no. I suspect that some of you are in a, that kind of a decision place in your life uh, now or have experienced a time like that where there, there are things like kind of um, demanding your attention, maybe demanding your allegiance, demanding more of your time. And probably some people are here right now have come here and been like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what's going on for me. And I need to know whether or not this is like an oh no thing or a yes, I should kind of thing. I wonder, maybe you should be convicted about the amount of your life is dedicated to the wrong things. There's probably a need for repentance there. It might be that you know exactly what calls you've been answering that you should be saying, oh, no, to. And if it was always obvious, we just leave it there. It's like, okay, you've got to say, oh, no, to things, just like Nehemiah did. Just remember the name of that valley and say, oh, no, when things are calling you away from the things of God. But sometimes, and I would say maybe even more often, it's not that obvious. In some ways, Nehemiah had it easy because they're literally inviting him to a place that says, oh, no. So it's like, okay, I probably shouldn't go there. But usually it's not that simple, right? Sometimes we don't know what the right decision is. Sometimes, even as Christians, we don't know what the faithful path is to choose. Is there a right answer? Is there a wrong answer? I don't really know. Um... Do you remember when phones used to have cords? Yeah, Lisa, you remember that. Thank you. Not power cords. Abby, phones used to have, <laughs> phones used to have like, like cords, not power cords, but those like uh, spring spiral cords, right? And you know, they all get tangled up so they're like this big knot, you try to like pull them apart. So you have to stay in one room in order to be on the phone and you're just kind of tethered to that line. And then you kind of memorize that room really, really well because it's the only room you could be on the phone in. Remember this? Okay. Yeah, sometimes if you were, if you were in a fancy house, you had a long cord. We didn't have that in our house. The other thing with those is sometimes when you called people on those kind of phones, and if they were already on the phone, you know what would happen? You get a busy signal. When was the last time you heard a busy signal? Yeah, for me, it's been a long time. In fact, in fact, I did have the chance to mention this to some kids recently, and they didn't even know that was a thing, that busy signals were a thing. Why would you? You don't even hear it anymore, right? It started, you could, okay, just track with me on this here, because I'm going to circle back around to it, because it started with call waiting back in the day. And maybe you remember this. You'd be talking to somebody, and there'd be a little beep on the phone, and they'd say, hold on, I'm getting another call. And then they'd vanish for a while, and maybe they'd come back, and maybe they wouldn't. Now, when somebody gets another call, they can just look at the screen, and they can see who it is, yeah? It's like, I'm getting another call from so-and-so, and they can see. And then they go, hold on a minute. This is more important than you. I'll have to call you back. And then they go talk to this other person. And what's happening there is they're making a decision, right? Because you're not going to answer both at once. You have these two conversations that are waiting for you, and you have to decide which call am I going to answer, which is what's happening there is this individual is making a choice. They have two calls demanding their attention. They have to choose to answer one of them, and you're going to be talking to one person, right? You get a call from another. You have to make this choice. To whom am I going to talk? For whom am I going to make myself available, right? I bring this up because I think metaphorically (laughs) and attention-wise and time-wise, you and I are on the phone all the time now. 
So much of our time is budgeted, it's being spent, it's being taken up. So much of our attention is being grabbed by things around us. We're surrounded by stuff that just loves for you to look at it, for you to think about it, for you to obsess over it. Work, hobbies, family, church, uh, I don't know, Netflix, friends, I guess, sports. You could, you could just picture it. All these calls and thoughts coming in all the time, demanding attention and time and focus, which means we better have some sort of framework through which we can filter these calls, yeah? So you can answer some and ignore others. We're going to be able to uh, screen our calls. The ability to look at things in our lives to know whether they should be answered or whether they need to be ignored. Because the valley isn't always going to be called, oh, no. (laughs) It's not always going to be that obvious. The decision isn't going to be titled, this is a big mistake, right? It's not always going to be clear. So we need to ask ourselves, am I making myself busy or am I making myself available? Well, God's word can help us. There are patterns here. They're very clear. And here it is. We need to answer calls that cause us either to reach up or to reach out. If they're directing you in either one of these directions, they're good. Ask yourself that then. This is the way that you can screen your calls. This is the way that you can kind of filter things in your life. Will this activity or relationship or habit or pattern, will it help me reach up to the Lord? Will it help me reach out to other people? If it doesn't meet one of those two requirements, you might have to be brave and leave that thing behind. Let me talk about this for a moment. First, reaching up. Uh, Incredible account of Moses in Exodus chapter 17 where we hear about the nation of Israel uh, wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, This guy named Amalek uh, brings an army to destroy Israel. And this isn't the Israel of today. This is when uh, the Israel of the Old Testament, when uh, they're kind of nomads and they're wandering around. And Amalek brings this army and they begin fighting the Israelites. And Moses and some of his entourage are watching this battle from the top of a hill. Can you bring the scripture up, Ryan? I think we have uh, from Exodus. Yeah. It says, Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill, and while Moses held up his hand, so he's looking down on this battle going on here. You're the battle. And, um, and he's looking down on this battle that's going on here, and it says, while Moses had his hands raised, the Israelites were winning. So you're winning. And now, when Moses had his hands raised, a fall, then the Amalekites began winning. So Moses had to stand there on the hill with his arms raised towards the heavens while this battle's going on. This incredible thing happens, right? You have this image then of Moses reaching up towards the Lord while the army is in the valley down beneath him fighting, fighting a desperate battle. It could go either way. The nation of Israel could have been wiped out then and there, but as long as Moses kept reaching up, The Israelites are gaining the upper hand. And I want to think about this because I just imagine, can you imagine how hard it was for Moses to leave all those people, his family, his friends, everyone he knew in the world, he left them behind to go walk up onto this hill and watch them in battle. That could not have been easy. For some of us, climbing a hill in itself is hard, but let alone the emotional weight of climbing up a hill and knowing you're leaving all these people behind in incredible danger. Even though it came at a cost, Moses chooses here to reach up. Even though it meant not getting involved in this conflict here, not getting involved in the fight, not getting into the fray, Moses still chose to reach up. He made himself available to reach up. Which clearly we're meant here to understand this is a picture of him giving God glory. Him choosing despite what was going on right here, him choosing, I'm going to give you glory, God. Though the battle goes on for hours, so Moses' hands get tired, and then you see here, his arms begin to drop. So Aaron and a guy named Hur, they hold up Moses' arms until the other army is finally defeated. Throughout that whole time, he was available, doing only one thing, giving God glory. And I got to say, like, I know you feel this. It feels like constant conflict in the world today, doesn't it? 
constant fighting, bickering, name calling, politics, social interactions, news, everything as one side against the other, and you just want you just want to get drawn into that. You might even feel like it's a good versus evil kind of thing, right? But in the middle of all that, the people of God have to be available. We have to be able, be available to reach up to give glory to the Lord. Be available to be like Moses. And just like with Moses, by the way, this will be the, at the expense of other things, won't it? I'd also say be like Aaron and her, right? People who help somebody else reach up towards God. So available, we said, for two things. This is, these are the two things, okay? If we're, if we're going we're gonna to make a, a kind of a framework for screening our calls, as it were, these are the two things you want to look for. One, is it going to cause me to reach up towards the Lord? And don't, don't mistake it for something like an easy decision, because that will mean leaving other things behind. Is it going to cause me to reach up towards the Lord, or is it going to cause me then to reach out? available for reaching out. Think of it this way. We reach up because of who God is. We reach out with what God says. When Christians, this is, this is, this is what I mean by reaching out. When Christians reach out to the world around us, it's not with empty hands. It's not even with just general compassion. It's with the message of the gospel. It's with the message of Jesus. It's not just, I, I just care about people. It's not just that we, that we just need to care about our neighbors, but that we care about them meeting Jesus. <laughs> Connecting with people in order to connect them with the love of Christ. Paul himself, we use Paul as an example of this, although there's many, but we'll use Paul as an example of this, maybe of an extreme personal experience he had of this. You might remember the account from Acts chapter 16 of Paul and his friend Silas who were imprisoned. They're there in prison, and they're kind of just stuck there, um, as I guess you typically are in prison, and they're sitting there singing songs and stuff like that, and then the city's hit by an earthquake, and it actually, as they're sitting in the prison cell, it breaks the walls of the prison cell, and so they're sitting there, and the, the walls are just open for them. And maybe, you know, instead of running away, instead of escaping when they had the opportunity, Paul and Silas end up preaching the gospel message to their jailer. I think we have this also from Acts, Ryan. It says that they they spoke the message of the Lord to him, the jailer, along with everyone else in his house. They could have left. And if I'm honest with you, I would have left. (laughs) Like if I'm sitting there in jail and, and, and the earthquake happens and like, it's like, oh, the Lord clearly wants me to escape here, right? I mean, if ever there was a sign that it's time to, that would have been it. I probably would have left. Paul and Silas make themselves available. Instead of that, they make themselves available to reach out to somebody else with the gospel of Jesus. How incredible is that? He meant what he told Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.2. Proclaim the gospel, whether it is convenient or not. In season and out, be ready to proclaim the gospel. It will not always be easy, but it will always be powerful. We have got to be ready. We've got to be uh, available to reach out with, with this, the most relevant and important of truths. And actually, I'm going to tell you, uh, church, this is true for, right, for our time here. And you might think, well, this is, good. this is a good message for when I go out from this place and maybe for when I go to Costco and stuff, and that needs the love of Jesus on a Sunday afternoon more than anywhere else. And so I'm going to bring it there, right? And that is true. But actually, church, this, we're, what we're doing right now, don't forget, this is an exploration of how you and I behave as a church community, as the family of God being brought together. This is true for you here as well as you come here at church. You're not just here to fill a seat, We are here in readiness to reach out with the gospel truth to somebody else in this room. That's why we're here together. To encourage one another as we try to follow Jesus in our own lives. So when you're here, be looking for times to be available to reach out with the gospel truth to somebody else. This is why we as a church set aside time for greeting in the morning. It's why we set aside time for fellowship after. It's not just for cookies and coffee. That's just a little trick. 
that's just so that you could share the gospel news. So, so you can share the love of Jesus with somebody else in this space with you, right? It's a Christ-honoring opportunity to be available to reach out to somebody else who might need the encouraging word of the gospel in their lives. That's why we gather in small groups. Why we have, that's why we even have a church directory. Why we have a prayer and a missions team. Why we're doing this uh, men's group next Saturday. We want to be available to reach out to one another in season and out of season and in every season. So I said at the beginning, this is kind of like, you can imagine the category of availability is just going to tell you, hey, you have another thing to add to your calendar. Like I need you to be more available for quiet time every Sunday morning or every weekday morning or whatever. You need to be more available to spend time in prayer. And while all that might be true, I'm not here to tell you to add things to your calendar. I'm telling you to be more brave about what's in your calendar already. So imagine that. If you were just to project, probably you can can call to your mind what's coming up for you this week. Take a look at that just for a second. Just Just take a minute to think about what your plans are. If you ever get out of this room... Remember this analogy of the phone ringing and the calls you and I choose to answer in our everyday lives. Ask yourself, as you think about what you got coming up this week, this afternoon, tomorrow, is that going to cause me, give me a chance to lift my arms to the Lord or to reach out to somebody else with the gospel of Jesus? A guy, we read this, a guy once asked Jesus, what's the most important, you could kind of rephrase it, what's the most important thing I should be doing with my life? <laughs> what's the greatest commandment, he said? What's the greatest thing we should be doing? What is, what is the highest achievement of humanity? What's the greatest thing I could possibly be doing with my life? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers the two things for which we must make ourselves available. We read it already. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. If that's a command, then availability is not just being passive and trying to have a little bit more free time and hoping that it will get filled with something good. (laughs) The available community is one that actively, we actively make space. We screen calls. We actively make space. We structure our lives around loving God and loving people. It's an active pursuit of opportunities to reach up and to reach out. We've got to be brave in our availability. Let's get the worship team to come back up here. And as, as they do, I'll remind you, your life, as was Nehemiah's, might be full of invitations to this valley of oh no. <laughs> and interestingly enough, that's probably what you'll say when you get there. <laughs> oh no. It might be hard to ignore them. They might feel like the most important thing in the world. But being available as a follower of Jesus is an exercise in bravery. It's an exercise in trust. It's making the hard decision to free our lives, to free our lives, to reach up to God and to reach out with his gospel. I invite you to join me in some time of prayer and kind of uh, maybe personal challenge and reflection. Because if there's anything that you can call to your mind right now, it's your calendar. It's your commitments. And it might be time to take a serious look at those. So why don't we stand together in this kind of time of reflection and, and time of honesty? Maybe even we'll say a time of bravery. And let's consider surrendering these things to the Lord's direction. Is the pattern of your life helping you reach up? 
Is it helping you reach out? And if it's not, maybe it's time to surrender those things and give them up.